Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I will walk you through all the RAM, not the code, but how, how to use RAM, what is in there, how you can use it and stuff like that. And you can ask questions in Flowdoc in tech room. I have it opened on the another screen, so I can, if you have uh, questions while I go, I can answer them. Um, yeah, so let me start with, uh, well, a little bit of disclaimer, SRAM is a, a, a React wrapper for Clojure Script and recently for Clojure as well, so it runs on Clojure Script and on Clojure. On Clojure Script it's a React wrapper, so you can render React components and to define React components, work with that, all that. On the closure on the on the closure side, it's server side rendering, much like Hiccup, and it also can work with server side React rendering. So you can render a page on, on a server, pass it on the client, and on the client React can mount on the already rendered DOM tree. And uh, yeah, it started as a simple tiny React wrapper, and uh, right now I'm seeing that there's actually quite a lot of stuff and uh, it's kind of uh, to talk about so let me start from the very very beginning so very very beginning is uh, how you use it you basically you just go to the oh, sorry this one you just add a dependency it's ram then you go to import uh, ram core as ram so uh, uh, everywhere in the, in there if i'm referencing namespace RAM, it's actually an alias for RAM core. And uh, this is the simplest component, uh, the, the really is the simplest one you can write. Uh, what it does is actually define a component called app, uh, which renders a diff with class app and text hello. Actually, the simple, uh, let's, let's make it a little bit more complex. Let, let's add uh, one parameter there. Um, do something like that and I have Chrome here no not that Chrome another Chrome yeah this one uh, and basically that's it so it it got rendered into a diff I uh, can inspect that we can expect inspect that and you see that there is diff for this class app on the text hello basically that's it um, okay and um, yeah, probably the best the best place to start is to just explain what what this DevC macro does, um, and uh, how it expands. Uh, what it does, it, it does quite a few things. But uh, okay, so the idea of RAM is to wrap React uh, and hide away uh, all this. Um, uh, React is very JavaScripty API has very JavaScript API. And RAM tries to provide a closure API that hides away much of React complexity parts of the React, and uh, it provides uh, much of a closure API. So it looks more like a closure, like functions and data. Um, yeah, and uh, this DFC macro, uh, it looks like um, it looks like a function, right? And that's because it uh, it actually expands into a function. So uh, this 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 stuff here will be expanded first. Uh, what will be created is uh, will be created a function. Uh, it's actually an anonymous function, but anyways, uh, which will look like uh, Sabono. If I remember it correctly, it will be something like that. Oh, th this problem pro might be a different namespace, but it doesn't matter. So basically, this is translated quite straightforwardly into a render function. This function. So the purpose of this function is to just uh, uh, render a component, uh, and uh, this, this will be passed into the React render method. Uh, Sablona compiler does uh, its thing. So as you can see, we don't use React components. We use uh, some hiccup-like syntax for for the components. And what Sablona does, it's a library uh, around depends on. Uh, it uh, converts this stuff into JavaScript components, basically. So every vector uh, you see in your return from your render function will be translated into calls like that. So basically, this will, one will be React create uh, component. Component is div, 
So this goes into the component. This goes into the attributes. Uh, attribute will be class, and uh, the text will will be a child. So basically, this gets translated to that, and this is what uh, is passed into React's render function. Function. So, so the second thing I've started with uh, what, what this macro expands to. So first thing is render function. The second thing is React class. React class will look like that. Uh, basically it's called to React, React create class. And it will have a couple of properties. Let me, I have a helper here. Yeah, it will have a couple of properties. First one is uh, display name. It will keep the name of the component you've defined there. So this name is reused. So uh, if you debug React components, so you have a plugin installed in a Chrome that shows you three of components, you will see real names. Then there will be get initial state. Uh, which I'll explain a little bit later, and there will be a render function. So basically, render function is a zero argument function that will call the function above the render function with arguments. So now we, uh, th th this is a very straightforward translation too. Uh, it's the only question we I haven't covered here is uh, how the arguments, so this function needs uh, the text argument, right? There might be uh, more arguments. How this there, these arguments will be provided into the render function because React doesn't let you define a function that accepts arguments. It uh, Render function has always have zero arguments, so it must be kept somewhere. And this is why uh, there is a little bit of a dance to get this uh, passed through the properties into the state and from the state into into the render function. So basically, get, get an initial state will uh, will basically uh, save properties into the state, and in render function from this uh, I am accessing state and get arguments from it. Now, this is a like pseudo code. It's not a real code, but it, it, it translates the idea. So it works something like that. So the, the, this, uh, there, there is uh, some dance around how to pass the properties of the arguments into the render function. But basically that's it. So the first thing, uh, there's, there is anonymous render function. The second thing, there is React class that will call that anonymous function. And the third thing that DevC defines is a factory constructor. It will look like that, uh, basically, if you have a component called app, uh, this, is, this will be a real function called app that accepts the same arguments, so basically exactly what we defined in DevC. There, there, there will be a, an actual function that looks like that, and that function will just create a React class, inst instantiate, create, create element class, the class that that have created was created above and on those properties we will basically pa pass uh, the properties pass the arguments into the into the rack properties then these properties will be uh, translated through the state into the render function so the idea of that all that is that we can pass the, the initial arguments when you call this function into into the render function. Yeah, and uh, this is what DevC creates. Th these two things are anonymous. Oh, well, actually, the first thing is anonymous. You can't access it. The second one is actual React class that gets defined. You can see it in JavaScript, in generated JavaScript. And the third one is real function that gets defined. So basically, DevC uh, actual defines function and you can use th that function like that so for example there is amount method in RAM 
that lets you mount a, mount a component inside the DOM tree, right? So, and uh, you, you need to pass a, a component in there and you just call that, that uh, component as a function. So uh, what you will be calling actually is this factory constructor that will create element uh, from React and stuff like that and pass these arguments and so on. So that's what uh, what, what the, this div C is made of. Now, um, a little bit of uh, yeah. If, if there are, if there are any questions, uh, you can ask me on Flowdoc. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a little bit of uh, of tutorial how this syntax works. So basically, this syntax is very simple. It's it's based on hiccup, but it's a little bit uh, more forgiving than hiccup. So if you learn this how this syntax work, it it won't always work in a hiccup, but mostly it's the same. So basically, it's tag uh, attributes optional attributes and children so the, uh, every vector that you return from the component will be treated as a converted into react component uh, or, or using this scheme so first of, first of all you need to, to specify a tag if you don't specify a tag it will be assumed diff so for example if we do this it will be treated as diff and you can usually actually use anything anything there you can span text area and stuff like that any, any, anything actually you can use multiple classes like like this you can uh, specify id as well so basically there are th three things you can specify tag name classes and id for the attributes attributes is always a map uh, it's optional if you omit it uh, everything will still work but if you put attributes there uh, it will be added to the to the tag so for example we can specify class in there like that and it's actually the same as uh, just do that. but the difference is if you if you need to determine the class dynamically you can do it there for example do that for example uh, if some condition is true use this class if, if not use nil and nils are okay um, you can use actually a vector so you can use something like that for class you can specify id as well and you can specify actually everything else every attribute on html you can think of uh, it is working uh, one gotcha here is that you must use um, kebab syntax uh, when you use dashes to split the words so for example there is a property allow full full screen and it should be written like that uh, this is like um, and uh, yeah, the the, the 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 reason I mention it is because React is very strict uh, on how you name your properties. Then uh, they use non-standard property names. So, for example, yeah, they they, they use capitalized proper camel case, but they're very strict about this. So, for example, in HTML, this property, for example, if you would write HTML, will be. If I remember correctly, it will be something like that. But uh, in React, they are very strict about it, and they only allow. So if uh, this this is HTML, if you write it in JSX, you have to write something like that. Otherwise, it won't work. And because we are translating into React, we we are very strict about property names too. And the only difference is we use native for closure kebab case. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I don't have the Chrome open. 
Okay, yeah, the question is, uh, does the class specified in the in the attributes override the class that, speci that was specified in in the tag? No, it doesn't, uh, they actually get merged. So uh, if you do this, you will get both classes. So uh, like that, uh, it will be class and class two. Which is quite handy because uh, if you use some CSS notations, there are some CSS notations where you, if you have, for example, a component, it always must have one class. For example, label is always a label. And then if you want to specify additional property, for example, label inactive or label header, you uh, you need to add class. You, know, you, you don't create separate class, you, you create class with specifier for example like that and it gets translated into stuff like that yeah uh, it's and this is much handier than what react does in react you can do this and in in this uh, in ram you can do that um, yeah, so I, I spec, spoke about the properties, yeah, uh, about the kebab case, uh, one, one special property there is style property, if you want to specify style, the style must be a map, you can specify style, can't specify style as a string, and uh, there is like a murder button, for example, something like that. If, if the property is um, measured in pixels, for example, border bottom is measured in pixels, there are two ways to specify it. You can specify it as a number, then pixels will be automatically added, or you can specify it as a string, for example, like that, that nothing will be done. If the property is a uh, string, then you just specify it as a string. And, uh, Event handlers are specified there as well. So, for example, if you have you you need on click handler, it will be like that, and you do anything in with the event inside. Yeah, uh, this is again uh, this is a kebab case. React gets very strict about in, in in HTML. You can write on click, you can write on click, but in React you only can write on click, and in RAM you only can write on click with dash uh, this event is uh, yeah basically this this setups uh, react uh, event handler if you know how Eva react uh, works with event handlers it's quite tricky it actually setups and one single uh, handler on the on the root component and then it dispatches by ids but anyways so this will be a react handler this event will be uh, rapid uh, norm normalized react events but basically it has all the same properties like uh, it has target it has, I don't know if it's a key press it has key code and stuff like that but th this is not br native browser events this, this is this are react events and what they do basically is that they backport features that are not supported by all the browsers into into the react so you can safely use if the property is an React Rapid event, you can safely use it in any browser. Or at least that's what they promise you to. Uh, and th the third thing is... Uh, oh, sorry, I deleted that. And the third thing, so attributes map is uh, optional. You can completely omit it. And the third thing is children. Children might be, for example, text nodes. It might be another component or another vector or it might be native react component any, anything actually and the one special options for children so, so you can you can do any, as much children's uh, as you want you can't you, you the only thing you if you're using string nodes you have to convert them into strings you can use for example keywords it will break it and uh, yeah the one special case here is uh, you can actually provide lists like that. Uh, why uh, and and lists actually are flattened. So if if it uh, walks through children and sees a list, its content gets expanded and actually it, it it will look like that. Why why is it useful? It is because. Uh, 
sometimes you just need to group multiple components. For example, if I want uh, a condition here, uh, for example, if some condition is true, I want to add two more text nodes, right? So I can't, I can't do this because when return only the last value and I, I need to return single value so I just do grouping like that or uh, another one is if I want for example label as a component and I want to uh, map it over some uh, some collection it will work well as well and, or four works everything uh, works so this one special case for children that uh, you, I think you should know about. And that's basically it. That's all there is in Sablona syntax for components, for specifying components. So every vector gets expanded, everything else is fine. Uh, is, is, is kept as is. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So there's if you yeah, by default React escapes all the strings. And for example, if you do this, oh, well, let's just actually demonstrate. It. Uh, so if I do this, or I want to to have italics here, right? And then go to there. So uh, I, I literally see the the text I've entered, right? So by default, everything in React is escaped, which is great and which is super safe. So this is safe by default. But uh, if if I want, if I somehow get a piece of HTML that I want to render as it is, and I know it's from a safe source. So for example, it it might never be a user generated string, but Anyways, I don't know. I download it from database or from, load from some resource. So I know this thing is safe and I want, want to render it as it is. I can uh, actually force React to do this. So to do this, I have to dangerously set inner HTML. HTML something like that let's let's hope i get it right yeah that it so uh and it will be rendered as html string so now if you have uh, if it's not correct it's probably it's okay yeah sometimes it might work so yeah uh, the, the only gotcha about that if if you provide that you can still have other attributes for example you have class you can have style right but you can't have children so you either have children or you either have dangerously set in the inner html okay uh, let's leave it dangerously there yeah <laughs> um yeah the next topic okay let's move on uh, so we've covered how to build like super basic ram components uh, we've covered the syntax. Uh, we covered what DFC expands to. Yeah, and the next big so big topic is uh, RAM state. So what you see here, so you can actually build some applications this way, right? But these applications will probably not be uh, very much interactive. So you can build uh, if you, you only use what I've just told you. You can build a quiz chant. Uh, there is a uh, another cursor script wrapper called Quizsend. Uh, it's super simple, super straightforward, and they 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 have like the philosophy is you can only pass values as arguments. So if you only use this style, you can actually build some applications, or, 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 of course, uh, but you will always have to change these arguments in the top component to to, to modify your applications, right? Uh, RAM actually the, the philosophy behind RAM is that uh, it is not telling you how you should structure your application and uh, what uh, like this is the one only single uh, way to write the application. No, it actually lets you choose your own style or even mix styles. For example, you have you can have mix of components like that. You can have a mix of compo uh, components like OM style components. Regent style components all in a single application. Uh, 
uh, to work around that uh, there is a concept of RAM state so basically uh, yeah this is uh, in, like it's uh, it's different from react state it's have nothing to do with it uh, it's uses react state internally to store the RAM state but RAM state is a, is a closure it's a map so it's just like immutable standard closure map that have uh, has several properties one of them is arguments so arguments that get passed to the to the component during the render method uh, they are actually stored inside the state uh, another one is room ID which is uh, like super internal stuff for for RAM only it's not for user consumption but it's it also gets stored in a state basically everything gets stored in the state uh, there is also a react component react component so because because uh, for example uh, yeah if you work with ram application you are concerned with ram components but every ram component is backed backed by a real react component and you can actually access this and you can call react methods on this so if you need to you can get back back to the down to the react component and work with it and it, it's it's accessible through the state as well so uh, what what is the state for state is actually just so you can keep your stuff right so if you mount a component uh, if the state is created for it and during uh, while it's mounted during its life cycle so it can get rendered it can have different past different properties it can change itself uh, during this while it's life while it's mounted uh, it can um, modify its state in its state and actually keep more stuff in it, right now the uh, state is closure map so it's not directly mutable uh, and this is a good thing actually and it is uh, accessible everywhere like in every method uh, in RAM you can there is a way to access the state so for example uh, can you access the state in diff, diff C component you actually can in the render method you actually can uh, there is a, a special form of diff C macros which is called diff CS uh, which is def component with state short for def component with state and uh, to use it you actually add one more argument to a render method like uh, now this is like a pseudo argument uh, it's not uh, you don't have to pass it on your own uh, it will be passed automatically so basically the, the app is still one argument function but uh, this is just to to use to a name to access the state and if you do that inside the render method you can uh, actually we can for example uh, see what is currently in its state now it's it will probably break because it won't know how to print oh no it, it's fine yeah okay so uh, it's exactly what what i i've told you right so there's there are ram arguments this one there is ram id and there is a react component which which is javascript object so it's printed like that and for example yeah we can we can access from arguments here for example from args state and this way we will print sin our single argument we can add uh, another one like that and add uh, n for example actually we can do that uh, you see that when I call app here, uh, I still pass only two arguments, and these arguments are this one, and the state is is just a name here. So it's still a two arguments function, rt two function. Uh, now we see two arguments. Okay, uh, and yeah, this is this is uh, one way to modify uh, to access RAM state. But it's not really useful when it's in there and, and it gets really useful once you well once you can actually store a stuff in there right and once you can modify it so how do you do that you do that in mixins and to 
to start with that, uh, I, I'm, you're probably familiar with React lifecycle, but uh, I'll just uh, remind you what what happens there. So basically, when you when you mount component like like that, uh, it gets created and gets actually deployed on a page. Uh, after that, it's it's kept in in somewhere in React's internals and it can it it actually have a life cycle so various things can happen with this component during its life cycle so the first things that, that will happen is will mount right so this is called to, right before the component is rendered on a page obviously you don't have a, a dom node in this method but you can do some preparation then there will be a render call, which could, which is called by React to understand what actually work, what markup you need to, on a page. Uh, then there will be did mount, which is called just after the render method. So you you might yeah you you might do for example some post processing. I find this for example useful uh, if I want to change some properties or for example a, for example if i mount a text area and i want to adjust its height to the contents so i basically i mount text area then i do indeed mount i find that it's dom node and adjust uh, the height of the dom node to the actual height of the contents of, the, of it yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, all sorts of uh, native dom callbacks stuff like that Okay, so this is the initial, like, this is called initial render. The first time your component gets rendered on a page, you get this stuff, right? After that, uh, there are slightly different set of callbacks. First one is should update. So basically, if I have component like that, and I, I re-render -re the application, I render the application again with the same component on the same place, it, React will actually try to reuse the old one by um, by just actually calling the should update and see if it needs to change everything, anything or not. So the should update is a boolean method that uh, should tell if a component needs an update and it, it returns false by default. And this is the same on RAM. So in React it default returns false by default and in RAM it returns false by default as well. Uh, uh, if so, if it returns false, there will be like will update called, then render again, uh, then did update, yeah, and stuff like that. So this is this is like uh, infinite loop. It can be called uh, very many times, and you don't actually control how many times it will be called. And uh, React asks you that these methods are like side effects free, at least render side effects free. So you, you should realize that this this will be called by React. You don't know how many times, and you don't know at what points in time. But anyways, and uh, the last uh, the last thing that will happen with the component is will unmount. So basically, if if React understands that it needs to delete a component, it will call will unmount on it. And after that, uh, it's gone. So this is useful for setting up some cleanup procedures. Yeah, this is uh, like component life life cycle. This is uh, this comes from React. Uh, in RAM, I just shortened the names a little bit and made them sound slightly more closure. Um, yeah, one great thing about it, and I, I haven't seen actually much. Uh, discussion about it but but i think this is super important and super useful is that with this life cycle callbacks you can safely associate and clean up resources with ram components for example if you can set up a timer and you can clean it up in vlan mount you can set up a timer in will mount or did mount or anywhere else and you can safely clean it up in will unmount and this is like super reliable way to do things a villain mode will always be called you can know it will never be called twice and you can well you can rely on it okay so having this kind of life cycle it's, it's actually super important for you can if you need some stateful resource you can put it into a component into a state and 
uh, don't worry about it. Okay, so uh, the one thing actually RAM does uh, compared to React, uh, it passes the state in every of this of this method. So these methods are callbacks. I will show you in a moment how you can define them on the component. But uh, the the idea is that uh, the component have a state right now. Then, for example, will mount happens, right? So uh, will mount will accept state and it will return state so basically the idea of this um, lifecycle method is that you accept the current state and return modified state or unmodified state uh, it depends on you let me show how it will work uh, will look like on, on component like that okay let's keep uh, oh yeah we can actually keep it printing the state this way we can actually see what what's inside Okay, so to define um, a mixin, you use this symbol like less than, right? Like or right, like an arrow, and you put a map after it. So this map should contain any number of these callbacks. In our case, let me comment this so I don't get. Uh, for example, we want to define did mount, okay? So we write it like that. Did mount must be function that accepts states and returns state. So this is like super useless component that uh, mix in that does nothing. It uh, accepts state and returns. We can actually, for example, print to just see that that happens. Did mount happens. And we can, for example, uh, as I can say, uh, as I said, there is React component hidden in 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 a, in a state like that. For example, let's uh, if you write stuff like that. Okay, uh, so I look up this key in a state. This key is like part of the react public api so it's safe to use it you can you will see a react component let's put comment to it and you can use ram dom node uh, that looks up for dom node associated with uh, current component node. what what this does is actually it uh, looks up the react component and then it calls find dom node okay this is slightly more use useful mixing it will print component and node every time the, this component gets mounted so let's go to this page let's see if i can get inspector let's go to the console yeah and uh, here it is so the first one is component actually react component the second one is node is the div node that we are rendering right so this was called on did mount okay uh, now the another another thing we can do we, ne we can actually put something into into the state right so state it's probably a good idea to use namespaced keys so they don't conflict with like any other mixins or with RAM default stuff in the state. So there is some state in, in already, so don't mess with it, please. And if you do that, we should actually see it. But oh yeah, we don't we, we don't actually see it because the component first get rendered and then we modify the state right but if you change this into wheel mount we should see it yeah okay there here it is uh room workshop core slash handle is seven okay um yeah and for example this way one useful thing you can useful thing you can do with it is allocate resources for example uh i do just set time out um, alert 
x oops in one second okay uh, so for example i want to alert after the component is mounted i want to i want to show an alert and to play it safe i i have to cancel this timeout if the component gets unmounted before this timeout fires right so what i will do is i will do will unmount as well uh, i will find this handle that i uh, that i stored in the state so uh, let h it will be handle stain and i will do oh uh, yeah and another important thing is uh, to return state from that it's, it's very easy to forget the return state so for example you're doing some side effects there but uh, you don't return nothing for example if i forget this there will be nothing returned from this method but it's important to return state okay uh we won't probably see yeah i have to make spaces have you seen that it's a super cool feature of uh, new fig wheel when it actually highlights where the error is so it's i really like it okay yeah, yeah. here's our alert uh yeah, we, we, we won't see how it gets cancelled because you have to actually unmount the component. It's, it will require a lot of setup, but basically that's it. That's this like safe pattern of how to how to store resources in in a component state and how to, for example, how to clean them up safely. Okay. Uh, one one an another useful thing is uh, that you actually can uh, access the arguments that were that were called uh, the component was called with. For example, if we uh, the, the, because they are stored in a state and we've seen uh, so this will be text, this will be number. Uh, they are actually just um, like that. Uh, we can yeah basically like that. So. Uh, if you need to access some arguments from from there it's you can do that everywhere you have a state okay and uh, one one gotcha here which i'm not very proud of but uh, it's the way these things are right now is uh, there is another method called transfer state and uh, which accepts old state and new state and you you have to return a modified new state and uh, right now if you put some stuff into the state you actually have to to write this method to pass this along so it will actually it will look like uh, uh, this is this is a tricky question so uh it turned out from my experience that most of the time the the thing you you want you, you want to your mixing to work is just transfer everything in the state now into the new state uh, and i will probably change that uh, that transfer state is uh, by default does that thing and you won't be able to you you won't need to write it but uh right now i made kind of wrong decision so you have to do it manually it's because uh, in React there are two ways to create a component. One is when you create a new one, and another one when there is already one component and you're mounting the same over it. So it gets kind of complicated. But anyways, uh, this will probably clean up very soon. I just have just to dig it a little and see if there are side effects. Uh, if I do it by default, so I hope I can do this by default, and you won't be able. You you won't need to write. Okay, uh, these are mixins. Uh, yeah, one thing, one more thing. Uh, if you, for example, if you did write did mount something, you can actually write another mixin right there that does did mount as well. And the way it works, uh, this this mixins will be stacked, right? So this one will be called first. It will accept like state one and will return state two. 
uh, this makes it will will get state two and will return state three. Okay, so each one of them can modify the state. All the state are like reduced. Uh, uh, all mixings are reduced over. So er every change will be there eventually. Um, yeah, so we can specify multiple mixings. And let me check what else they have to say. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know. I, I, I just probably want to uh, repeat it again. The, the states are closure maps, uh, and internally, the component, of course, internally, there is something like um, volatile state, which is like. Yeah, volatile well, state. Yeah, anyway, there, there's internally there's volatile variables that is stored in the current state, right? So the, it is mutable. But every method in a RAM accepts a map, an immutable map, and expects you to return another immutable map. So uh, you don't directly call like swap or uh, update or set on, on this volatile state stuff. And this like um, have two positive uh, things. So first one is you don't uh, it's it's easy to understand your code and you don't die like it's it's the code gets more structured and the second one is you can safely write closures over it so for example if I do uh, here if for example I've set a timeout which does something with a state for, for example there is a request render oh, not like that. Uh, okay so if i do that uh, you, this, this will create an anonymous function right that will be actually a closure and it will close our current value of a state so now if that was like a volatile variable you can accidentally close over the volatile variable and it will be dereferenced de at the moment when this gets actually called and then things will get really really messy uh, but instead i am closed over this immutable map and it doesn't matter if somebody uh, in one second, doesn't matter what happens with this component, it can get even unmounted, or I don't know what can happen with it, or other mixins can completely change the state in unknown and predictable ways, but uh, this this uh, callback will still be called with the previous va value of state, so you can always be sure it will work as you intended. And this turned out to be really, really uh, good thing I'm, I'm really happy i made that decision okay um chat questions in the chat transfer is actually transfer yeah i've i've probably fixed that but it's transfer state not transfer state trans state exactly uh can you have a render in the mixing yeah uh, can you have a render in the mixing yeah actually um Actually no, but internally there there is a render function that um, uh, internally it, it gets converted into a mixing, but it expects that there will be only one render in in the whole stack of mixins, and the, the the stuff you define here is uh, is put into render. So actually this will be converted in like if there is no mixins, so it will be converted. Converted into something like that. So basically, even the render method, uh, uh, yeah. So the first thing uh, RAM does is collects all the mixins in in and builds a one single big map like that with all the mixins defined only once and uh, implementations that calls all the stuff you that was in there. And render is one of them. It's always defined by default, so there's no reason to redefine it but yeah uh, there is actually one very interesting hook it's a wrap, a wrap render you can define a wrap render method which is uh, 
if I remember correctly, it accepts state and it must return state DOM. No, it's actually not. I'll check. Yeah, so here is the wrap render. It render it accepts render function and returns render function, of course. Yeah. Render fan and returns render fan. And what render fan is, is uh, it, it's actually the stuff as I decided. It's state into state and DOM. So I, I can actually modify state in a render function, but it's, there is no hooks in, in this default DFC form. But internally you can do that and you can uh, modify render functions actually by providing stuff like that. It's not very useful. Uh, I have never used it in user code, but there is one place in in RAM code where I'm using it. It's actually it's used for for reactive mixing. But yeah, but it's kind of tricky, but, but because it's not very useful, so it's it's okay. It's probably okay. Yeah, so yeah, we've covered uh, stack it, we covered resource allocations. Yeah, let's let's move on into built-in mixing. So RAM comes with a couple of batteries, uh, with some mixings that are like useful by default and you, you don't have to write them by yourself, right? The first one is really, really simple. It's RAM static. Let's change state, return text. Yeah, so RAM static is a mixin that uh, does what. Uh, if you've read David Nolan's initial post on the OM, there was uh, like there were, there were two main advantages of wrapping React into Closure Script. First one is that you can do batching on request animation frame, which OM does and RAM does as well. And the second one was like you can provide a default implementation of should component update which will compare immutable objects and thus it will be super fast. So RAM static actually does exactly that. So it provides, uh, it actually equals to something like that. Uh, it will uh, not equals room args old room args new basically uh, component should only update if new arguments pass to this to, to it are different from the old arguments passed it so if i render the same app with the same arguments same two arguments it won't update it should up, should update it will return false and uh, the render method will never be called I wonder if it, if it's actually like literally like that. Um, it must be. Yeah. yeah, it's actually exactly like that. Should the date will stay new thing. Cool. Yeah. So, so this is super simple. Okay. Uh, and it, it it's kind of useful is you if you have you know, like uh, if you have uh, for example if you have state stored in the one big single atom that contains all sorts of nested maps and vectors and you tear it apart and pass into child components this will be really useful because it can compare references really really fast right uh, it's not uh, that useful for example if you have uh, uh, for example, if you have a data script database passed as an argument because comparing two databases is actually very, very expensive. So if database is big, it actually have to compare every data on it uh, until it finds the first difference, right? So it's super expensive and this will do more harm than be useful. And the second thing is, uh, and I've seen a couple of people uh, complained about it so for example if you pass a callback in there and this callback is not a statically defined function but instead if it's a closure 
every time you pass a closure in there, it will be created a new, right? So for example, the, the parent component defines some callback and pass it to the child component. So every time the parent component is rendered, it will create actually create a new closure that will be passed into child component, and this will always be different, right? There, there's actually no useful way to compare functions, so this won't to do any any good. But apart from that, you, you can actually work around that, for example, by writing your own version that only compares, for example, first argument but not the second one and stuff like that. But uh, you can actually. That, that, this is uh, limits of uh, usefulness of realm static. Um, okay, this is this is the first of bundled components. The second one is realm local. So if you're used with to React, uh, you know that there is kind of useful stuff called a state in React components. A state is a is a, an object. Uh, and every which, and every change to that object, uh, uh, it's an object associated with current instance of component. And if you change that object, uh, the component gets rendered, right? So it's kind of local state for a component. So run local is actually the same stuff, but done in in the concept of React and in RAM, Sorry. <laughs> and it works like that. Uh, you, for example, let's write the simple applications that count clicks. For, for example, we will create. A, first of all, you've noticed that RAM static, for example, is a is a is a, is just a map, and RAM local is a function. It's because you different. You need different uh, like different values, default values, different names. So basically you call a function that will return a maxin. So calling this will return a map, uh, which is a maxin you want, right? Uh, there are two arguments. First one is default value, the value we start with. And the second one is a name, uh, is actually a key uh, under which it will be stored in a state. So to access this, we will need the FC form and uh, it will work like that. Um, okay, uh, Oliver, I will ask uh, answer a little bit later. Okay, uh, you actually count uh, clicks state. Okay, this this should work. Let's let's see if it works. Yeah, and we have zero. Okay, great. So let me explain. So uh, you define this mixin. This is default value for this uh, for this uh, atom, and this is key. Then we we access the state inside the render method, and we look up this key in the state. Okay. So what we get in, uh, out of it, we get an, an atom, atom. Okay. Uh, this atom contains a value. Uh, initially, it contains this value. So we just print it, and we get. Uh, the count. If you print Z, we should see atom object. Okay, great. Um, what uh, was great about it? If you change this value, uh, the component will get rendered. Uh, so basically, we will do that by providing on click methods there, which will be function. We don't need an event there, and we will just swap. In the count increment, like that, this should work. So let's try clicking on it. Yeah, and if we click, it gets updated, right? So what happens there is every time I click, every time I click, uh, this function gets called. This function swaps this um, this atom here, and uh, the component already has a. Uh, a watch on this atom, and every time it's called, it gets rendered. So this way, it's very very similar to the to the local state in React, but it's kind of different. Okay, you can use uh, any values there. Of course, you can you you can use maps, you can use strings, anything you want. You can use booleans, for example. You can use multiple way. Oh, so somebody has not muted. I can hear a lot of echo. Uh, for example, we can use uh, some 
mod, uh, mod will be view, for example, and we can switch between view and edit. Okay, uh, yeah, that's it, but it's about uh, local, local state. Uh, the implementation, we can actually look into implementation there. So basically what it does, it uh, defines the wheel mount. The wheel mount will uh, create this the initial item. It will... Then it will set up a watch straight away on this uh, item and every time it is changed, it will call request render on the component, on the initial component, on the right component. And there is also transfer state def defined there. Okay. Uh, this is run local, very useful. I use it a lot. It's like much more useful for me than static. But again, uh, mm So, sorry, uh, a lot of little boxes. You mean uh, that I defined, for example, here defined two different uh, items instead of one? Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. But uh, well, I think it makes no big difference actually. Just kind of easier. So, for example, uh, one useful thing uh, is that uh, the the item defined there, you can actually pass it down to the child components. And shell components can modify it as well, right? So, for example, uh, if you've seen insights, I don't know if we can show you it right now. I can probably can. So for example, let's go there. Let's go there. No. Sorry. It goes there. So, uh, for example, for example, um, hmm. okay, yeah, uh, this uh, this this part here and this part here are independent ch children, right? So mm -hmm. there's one big uh, parent component defined. And there is like a local state that defines if comments are open or not, right? Then this atom gets passed down to, to this component, this is like footer, and it gets passed like to this one, this actually shows the com comments, right? And this footer changes, uh, when you click here, it changes this atom, and this change propagates back like to the place where it was initially defined, and the parent component knows that now it's time to render the children and or now it's time to hide them well, stuff like that uh, so it's 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 a very simple concept it's really useful to like pass this and yeah well the, the reason i mentioned it is because there's like a couple of this uh, different items that get passed into different times so for example there is a component that defines if this stuff is in a edit mode or in a view mode there is a, a, a local state that defines atoms that defines if com comments should show on or not and there is different st other stuff so i find it just easier to define multiple atoms there yeah okay uh, i will should probably read the questions uh, the first one, uh, what's the best way to pass a data script DB down if an equality check is expensive? Could you have modified static mixing that doesn't compare a data script DB, assuming you only wanted to use static rendering? Yeah, so the answer to this question uh, is uh, if the triple eight just to check if data script DB has changed. Yeah, so actually you can do two things there. The first one, you can actually use uh, identity check. Right, it's uh, in in closure script is identical instead of equal. So static use equal instead of equal. Yeah, the static use equal. You can write the same, but we change checks for identical, 
and uh, it will be super cheap and it will it won't structurally compare that script DB it will only compare if uh, the DB actually changes but uh, in my practice for example in chat uh, project I found that it's not very useful because the, the data script DB uh, first it doesn't change like uh, without reason like when it changed it it, it actually changed and the second one is uh, I actually render everything when database changes so uh, the actual the actual render is get doesn't get called uh, uh, just out of a sudden it it's actually gets called when it actually changed so I know in advance that it's changed so I don't have to check if it's changed something like that there's nothing like to optimize I can I can put this check but it will always return false because render this will, will always be called uh, uh, only when uh, the database actually changes. Um, yeah, and the second one you can you can just not define a static uh, component on a component that's uh, past data script DB. Uh, I am not actually using any of them inside the chat project, and this is because you can't. Uh, I pass entities a lot, and you can't actually compare entities uh, as well in a meaningful way. So that, that just just doesn't uh, make any use for me, but uh, it's it's actually a valid concern, and I would uh, probably later do some stuff to optimize that stuff. So right now, any, anytime anything changes in the chat, everything gets rendered. It's, it 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 can get quite expensive. So we probably need some ways to optimize it. For example, if I only change one prompt, there's no reason to render the whole chat, right? But it's much more complicated to set up, and there is no like easy answer like uh, define static on everything that everything suddenly works super fast. You can do that if you're using a single item approach. Uh, if you do that, uh, there's only immutable data structures all the way down, and you only change uh, uh, the only parts that change are the actual parts you're changing. Uh, so you can safely compare them. It's it's fast, and uh, you can do that. For, for for this compound, okay? But you can do that for something big like data script DB. Yeah, another answer for that is actually to, to use pool, pool API instead of entities and don't pass the whole DBs. For example, if I'm rendering a user user uh, component, it, it only needs to know username, user avatar and stuff like that without knowing anything about like whole data script DB and if I pull that, the pull returns the actual map, not an entity um, you can use the uh, static mixing the gotcha there is uh, the parent component needs to know which data the child component needs it's, this is kind of a downer Uh, yeah, and you will have to run your pulls or every pull on every change. Yes. Okay. Uh, another question: Don't you feel that local state is easy but not simple? There is trade-off with reasonability in using local items as opposed to having big global map of data that everything is rendering from. Um, I'm not sure about it. Yeah. So what local? Uh, the, the, it is super easy to reason about. Uh, an application that is structured without local state okay uh, it's super easy and uh, it's very straightforward it's super immutable super like uh, nested functions all the way down but if you use local state it introduces like state and you get something like objects and object oriented programming where uh, or something like swing application where you have uh, stateful dialog is a stateful component with, with you can call methods and like hide show and every label is stateful component it's actually an object right and you get something like that yes uh, but sometimes it's what you want actually so for example the, pr the examples I have shown uh, like uh, do I want to see comments or not it's actually it's okay to have this stuff like locally and not globally defined I think so. I find it useful. I don't find that it complicates 
stuff too much because usually if it defines anything in, anything in there it's usually only used inside the render method there it's not like leaking anything everywhere it's not like a global variable that you have no control over who accessing it right the only way it can leak into other components it it's like by passing it as argument so for example let, let me actually show this so you can know what i'm talking about uh dfc label um, we just accept count there and uh, we actually we will do what this does we will do the same all right Spam. okay this should work this should work and we need to Okay, great. So now the, this zero is uh, actually counter that I'm rendering inside the, the main component, and this label is uh, well, it's called twice. Okay, yeah, but it's because it's nested. Uh, the label is um, child component, right? And when I click it, it's accidentally. So yeah, the, the, this structure is actually I pass this count into the child component, and it, it can it can now it can increase the count as well. Uh, this is uh, like uh, a dependency between two components, but I, I think it's fine because basically what this it's a way for child components to propagate state back into the parent component uh, first and. Uh, it's all explicitly defined, so it's like no tricky stuff going on. You, can, If you are passing this state, you always pass it was like an argument uh, very explicitly. You can always see that this label depend, depends on some atom. You don't know where it comes from, but you know that there is an atom you can read and write. So uh, most of the times it's okay. And most of the times it is used only for the stuff that should not actually go into anywhere outside, right? There is no way to use this state outside of the components. So for anyways, uh, it's not get, uh, the changes don't get propagated outside, they don't leak outside the component boundaries. Meaning that uh, it can be only used for stuff uh, like uh, internal, uh, not important, uh, transient component state for example right now I need to decide if I I should show comp comments or not it's it's actually have nothing to do with the global state it's just current state of component and you can uh, it's actually it's also a good thing because you can put all all star all crazy little details and they get encapsulated inside a single component so for example when I was showing this uh, sliding in comments when you click on a comment you, the, the the panel got slide in right there is actually quite a complex uh, setup to to do that because well the css animations and to do css animations you need to explicitly time uh two or three css classes in 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 uh, specific time frames for example uh, i first need to mount the component right after amount but uh, after for example 16 milliseconds I need to add first class which is uh, panel is invisible then I have to wait another 16 milliseconds and add second class that says the panel is now fully visible then I have to wait for like 200 milliseconds to wait when the render uh, the animation ends and after that I can only made assumption that comments are visible now okay this is like super crazy stuff and it will be even more crazy if this leaks in the global state right so the global state have nothing to do with it it's just little small details and i find that super useful and super good uh, that they, they get encapsulated inside in a component and that don't leak to outside of it so i, I kind of like it and I'm, I'm really using it a lot
Yeah, let's move on. Probably. Okay. The I, I've told you about the local. I've told you about the static and the third kind of uh, the third kind of uh, sorry of mixing is uh, reactive components. So reactive components. The idea for them came from reagent right so in reagent you, you define everything as the atoms and you just uh, define which components depend on which atoms and uh, they automatically re-render every time to change so to do that uh, we actually we can define let's emulate counts define a global atom there like that uh, we don't need to see s anymore That means that uh, this stays the same, this stays the same, and yeah, and we need this. Okay, uh, let me check that it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Okay, let's check again. Ah, perfect. It's uh, no, but now I'm clicking. It's not, nothing happens, right? Uh, this is because uh, I, I I have uh, swapping this atom, but the component doesn't get rendered, right? There is nothing uh, in this code that tells that every time this stuff changes, you have to render. Okay. Uh, what, what I can do actually, if I I, I can uh, do stuff like that, and watch count. Uh, and I can call this refresh method. Okay, refresh just uh, does uh, like mount. This should work. Sorry, it still complains about count. Let me. Okay, uh, this should work. Let's let's check if it works. Yeah, it works. So uh, right now, so I I created this atom, and every time I, I set up a watch manually, but every time it changes, I uh, do uh, this uh, mounting again, right? So this this call this forces the component to re-render. You can notice that uh, there is. Uh, I am not passing these counts as an argument. Instead, I'm referencing this global variable, but that's okay. Uh, so this is uh, okay, but this is like can get really tedious, and uh, you you actually have to do cleanup of these watches. Watches are stateful, and they are not automatically removed. So for example, if I am not no longer need this component, I should probably remove this watch, but. Uh, it's get, it can get really tricky. So to work with that, there is reactive component. React uh, mixin, sorry. Uh, reactive mixin is called ram react. Ram reactive. You add it like that. And the second thing you need to do is you need to change uh, every dereference that you care about into into ram react code. Now this works almost exactly like like the reference it, it uh, takes an item it returns its value but additional thing it does it actually express that i'm now interesting uh, interested in this exact atom so please re-render me every time it renders right so let's check we've removed watch removed watch from this atom so there is no manual no forced refresh there uh, let's refresh the page so we know that the watch is not there. Uh, yeah, and it works. Okay, right. So what what it does? It actually it actually subscribes to this atom every time you call uh, this React in a render method. It subscribes to this uh, counts, and uh, it gets rendered every time this this atom changes. Right. So the good thing it it does quite a, quite a complicated things. For example, uh, it. Uh, 
it tracks uh, what you have subscribed to or, or and what you haven't subscribed to. So for example, this can be in a, an if statement, right? So there, there can be two uh, two different items and I can, depending on some, some condition, I can subscribe to one or to another and it will do just the right thing. So if, uh, if an, on current render, the, the, the first branch is true, it will subscribe the, to the first count if the on the subsequent render the second um the second branch is true it will unsubscribe from the first one but subscribe to the second one it all happens automatically behind the curtains but it does just the right thing and when component gets unmounted uh, it will uh, remove the watch so there is no garbage uh, there is no garbage accumulated there is no like hard references at all everything will be fine and it will be reliable uh, this is again so useful as well you can for example yeah you can imagine how it's useful right if you have uh, your components defined as uh, one big item or you can multiple items dependent items maybe I'll get into it in a second uh, you can use reactive and actually you can structure your application just you can you will the way you will structure reagent application um, and there are two more things into that. Yeah, uh, but yeah, unlike yeah, one 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 thing to mention, unlike the reagent, in reagent uh, you can't use regular items. In RAM you can use actual closure closure script items. So there is no special type for that. There is uh, like you have to use different way of to the refer the the reference but you can use uh, actual items which is which is good thing a good thing okay uh, now there are two things to since uh, there is such a big focus on items i decided that there will that will be good to put to, to some ways to uh, provide some useful utilities to work with uh, items in different ways uh, i call them batteries right so there are two two of them the first one is cursors. Uh, if you're familiar with OM, you probably know there are cursors. In OM, cursors are super complicated and it's really tricky to to use them. And they like trying to mimic like regular closure, closure data structures, but they are not, and they did quite a shitty job on it. But okay, uh, in RAM, cursors are really really simple. So for example, let's define our data like that user name okay uh, there is a single item that contains nested maps let's uh, just render this name so for example we will use the room react as well uh, yeah let's render sorry I'm, I'm thinking about okay let's let's get name there and we will oh actually we don't need do we? yeah we don't we need name okay um and on click we'll change the name reset name okay 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 and we need to pass the name in there okay uh, so what we do we will do there is we will call cursor data mm -hmm. okay perfect and if we click it will change okay uh let's actually let's actually also print the whole data structure as well. uh -huh. yeah perfect okay so the idea of cursors is uh, if is that you can get a deep link inside an atom and this deep link inside it will uh, behave exactly like an atom too and it will propagate changes back into the, the main data structure right so for example it, it's actually the idea is the same idea as lenses 
So you have uh, a big hairy atom with a lot of nested structure. You want, uh, for example, you have a component that just have to render a name and you want it to be able to change name as well, right? So what you do is you you focus on this uh, for this on this path. For in our case, it's a username, right? Uh, uh, the path is, is there. So uh, data is one atom. You focus on this uh, this path, and it returns another stuff. It's not actually an atom, but it, it behaves exactly like an atom. You can uh, watch it. You can swap it. You can reset it. Uh, do all the stuff. The reference it. All the other stuff. You, you you do with um, with items, right? And uh, this step, this, this, this reference will propagate changes back. So for example, uh, right here, first we, we print it, and uh, the, basically we dereference it. We can also use regular deref there. Um, it work. It will work the same, but it won't re-render on a click. Okay. So we, we're using React re React to call to uh, to to force component to render and we can uh, reset it as well right and this change when we reset it inside uh, we actually this component only knows about the name right it can see nothing in this uh, big uh, data structure except the name so for example uh, there might be an H it won't see an H right it will only see a name but it can change that name and that name will get um, changed in the main data structure as well leaving everything else uh, intact, just as it was before. So that's uh, that's a big idea of the cursors. Cursors uh, work like that. Uh, you specify a set of keys just as the way you will specify them in get in, uh, and it returns you some something that behaves like an atom. Um, yeah, it works with uh, regular atoms. It works with reactive, it works with everything else so it's it's uh, like a good system okay um yeah, the second the second stuff is uh, is derived atoms uh, the idea came from reagent as well and actually before the even before that i was uh, like a couple of times i was doing just the same stuff it's it's really simple ideas for example uh imagine that you have uh, you need an you, for example, you have, um, I don't know, um, okay, I have this example, I, for, Im, imagine you have, no, uh, screen width, right, it's an item that uh, holds screen width, I, I actually have that in, in chat, uh, and once you, uh, when you resize the browser window, it will, it will change, okay? And what you want to do, you want to know which layout you should to use. So now layout is a function of a screen width, right? But not every time the layout changes, screen width, sh uh, screen width change, layout should change. So there are like uh, boundaries or thresholds, okay? So we define uh, layout datum. And for example, we want it to be small, medium, or wide, okay? Now, how do I say that every time screen width changes, uh, layout should change as well? Uh, usually, we will you will do some watch stuff. So if it's less than 600 pixels, we will use small. Uh, if it's uh, less than 1000 pixels, we will use medium. And if it's uh, less than, oh, otherwise, we will use white, okay? Uh, now we, we need to reset. Is that very so? Okay, uh, let me get there, and we need um, we need something like like that, and we need something like. Uh, 
like that. Um, and we need actually. Does anybody remember how to define get the windows with? Sorry? No, no there's no viewport please. Yeah, you know it's okay, great. Uh, so what we will do, we will we we will reset uh, screen widths uh, with uh, JS window actually I have to put it there. Now I am doing something crazy, there will be no arguments to our app. Great, and we don't see anything. Why is that? Ah, yeah, because you can't render actually, you can't render uh, keywords, so we need to. medium this is small great uh, exactly what we wanted but again yeah uh, this is quite a setup there right and it gets even worse if we have for example second item so for imagine if we have uh, some variable uh, telling us if it's mobile or not and right now it's false but uh, if uh, it's mobile doesn't matter what it is what the actual screen width is we want to always use small uh, and stuff like that the dependencies can get uh, like really crazy for example for i, I have this uh, layout item in chat and there are like three items it depends on okay um so you need to add the second watch and it's with the same function probably and it get really not easy to set up so uh, what i end up with is just uh, a function that does that for you so it's called derived atom you specify what you want to depend on then you specify a key uh, this key will be used uh, to add watches uh, watch requires a key don't don't add watch multiple times and you can remove it later and then you specify a function that should recalculate the state this function will accept actually already the reference values of uh, of these items right so in our case it's screen widths and mobile uh, so i will name the w and m and what i have to do is i have to return a new value uh, again the reset will happen automatically so i do that um, that. and it should work the same okay so i don't need that anymore let's see yeah of course i need namespace now i haven't closed enough parentheses Okay, great. I don't know why it starts like that, but okay. Um, let's check. Yeah, it works the same, right? So I resize, it resized. Great. Uh, so this is just a convenient method to set up 
uh, stuff like that when one item should change every time another one changes right uh, not, not exact uh, actually not every time but uh, every time the value returned by this function is changed so uh, there's there's like single uh, why I even bothered about it uh, you, you can actually recall this function every time you need uh, to calculate the layout, right? So uh, why I bothered about it is because the uh, screen width can change like uh, every ev on every mouse move, right? It uh, changes hundreds of times there. But the layout actually changes really not that often. It only changes if you pass some threshold, right? So change one, two, three times, for example. Uh, and if you if you if you what you actually depending on is the layout not the screen width it will be much more smarter to depend on the layout and only render what it actually changes rather than depend on screen width and uh, trying to render on every screen width change and uh, like render with the same layout over and over only because um, you are depending on the wrong item so to get this kind of setup i'm using derived items which calculates some function and if that function returns the same value as before there will be actually no reset called on this layout item and uh, if you have reactive items they will not get updated and uh, this is kind of uh, very useful to get um, yeah uh, i wanted to say something yeah and of course yeah this 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 kind of setup is only one way right the so cursors are two ways uh, if you define a cursor you can actually reset and swap it and the change will be propagated back into the main item the derived items are only one ways if you have a derived item like layout you can't reset it you know you can you actually can reset it but it'll, it, it will have no effect on screen widths of course right it won't propagate back and only propagate one way so, but but you can set up like uh, chains of uh, dependent items, or you can set up chains chains of uh, or direct uh, acyclic graphs uh, of the dependent items, and it get, they can get quite complex. Okay, uh, this comes with uh, with RAM as well, mm, and I, my hope is that using this you can actually repeat everything on and reagent have and write applications that way or decide to write them another way and mix the styles so you can actually mix cursors with derived items and they will work together you can use reactive items you can use static items uh, components or uh, anything like that okay i have a couple more topics there uh, one is interop so as i said there is like react is driving all these things of course uh, that. yeah mm -hmm. yeah sure okay yeah so mm, yeah it's actually quite quite uh, i'm i'm almost there <laughs> yeah well one stuff i wanted let, let me just copy paste couple of things so i can show you what what uh, what uh, you can actually do so i've already told you that you can access native react component uh, from the state you can do this in render method and you can do this in ink scenes and you can do everything you can do with uh, like with uh, native react component like call, calling methods on it and i don't know so there is a quick method to access dom dom node from that uh yeah you can actually mix uh, your sablona markup markup with uh, native react components so if uh, there will be for example native react component returned like that it won't mind it at all so you can call for example create native text area like that and it will be okay you can mix it if, for example you have div that uh, have native text area inside it's it all works fine you can use uh, keys so one of the one of the stuff with react it always complains about keys so you can specify key on diff like that but there is different method to specify key on application so to, to put key to application you can you uh, can put it 
in there, right? Because their arguments goes there. So I use uh, run with uh, key like that, and it will uh, your component will have this key as well. Okay, uh, and that oh yeah, and you have you can have class properties. So one thing uh, that it's they're specified just like mixins, but they are like static stuff. Uh, class properties. So class properties is a map of all the stuff you want to go straight to React class. So this can be like static. Uh, there's like static or statics, I don't remember exactly. There are context uh, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, if you need uh, escape hatch to define these things to interrupt with some React existing React library on something like that, you can do that. And uh, that's basically it. So let's move to server side rendering. Um, huh. Let me try to set up a, a CLG version of this file and see if we can actually have a demo of uh, actual. Okay. Uh, you see here that I'm doing exactly the same things, but I'm doing them in a CLG version. Okay, let's let's see if Light Table will catch it up. It should. Uh, so the idea behind server-side rendering is uh, we actually define the same API, almost the same API we have in CLGS version of RAM, but inside a CLG file, so it can be required from a CLG program and it can do dev c dev components and it can render into strings right so there is no of course there is no apis uh, about classes mounting dom methods uh, nothing like that there is no react dependency on a server so it's native gvm uh, all java implementation or closure implementation there's no react there's no javascript and there are mixins, but they are kind of simplified. So there's no like life cycle. There's no stateful components. It's like really, really simple. And I'm, I'm not sure why it takes so long, but oh yeah, it worked. Great. Okay. Uh, this uh, at the bottom, I'm not sure what it's about, but it shouldn't worry us. Okay. Uh, uh, and as, as you can see, so basically when you define a component and it, it DFC is a macro and it the, the, the way we did it is it, ex, it expands differently on a server than it does on a client. Okay, so on a server it does much more straightforward thing. Basically it expands into a regular function that literally return the stuff you put in there. So if you put stuff like that in there, and you call that as a function, but let's add argument text there. It will return what you've just defined. Sorry. Yeah, just like that. Okay, uh, so that, that's the way we've done it on a server. There is no like stateful component, there is no will mount, uh, like multiple render should component update like that. There is uh, the will mount and did mount. If you have them on your mixins, they will be called. Uh, they will be called only once, uh, and a render method will be called only once. So this this is because you might have some useful setup like log or RAM local, for example, in them defined. So you have to have that defined for render as well. So they called once. And uh, what you can do, this is not really useful except for maybe testing. And uh, what you can do with stuff like that, uh, you can actually render this to a string, right? So there are two methods in RAM defined for servers and they're not present on a client. And they uh, render HTML. If you pass stuff like that into render HTML, this is what you get. You actually get some string that you can include into your HTML page. And this string is uh, specially defined so the React component can be mounted on top of that. So uh, say uh, you will probably need an ID defined in there somewhere to mount it like that. Okay, so you can find it later on the page. But if you mount the same component as, as there on the on the page that have exactly this markup, 
React will uh, check the checksum and it will reuse this markup. So everything will work like super smooth. Um, No, I, I think there, there will be a render loop because React needs something to check against. But it, what, what it will prevent, it will prevent going through the DOM tree. So it won't inspect, uh, don't want to walk the DOM tree to check that every DOM node that you have defined and that it has in markup. So the thing is, the first time React starts, it doesn't know what, what's already in a DOM tree, right? So it have to check it and it have to uh, to bring it to the form that uh, your virtual DOM tree is uh, rendered first time. So render it first time and it need to go to the DOM and check what it has to change uh, to, to, to get it look exactly what you've returned from a render. So if you have a checksum, it will uh, calculate checksum and if it matches, it won't check. So it, it's kind of faster, right? If the checksum mismatch, it will uh, put a warning on you and it will have to walk this tree and uh, modify it. Uh, usually it's okay, usually it's uh, like small discrepancies like uh, the order of uh, classes is different, of order of arguments is different, stuff like that. Uh, so it won't actually recreate the DOM tree but it have to, will have to walk. It's, uh, so it's, uh, it's okay. Yeah, and uh, the thing is, uh, because we are not using uh, um, we're not using React on a server, right? We're using uh, JVM implementation. We have to trying to mimic all, all the React behaviors in there. It, 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 don't, it won't always work. Sometimes, for example, attributes will get in the wrong order. If you, if you have a map of attributes, you can't ex exactly guarantee the order of them. Uh, and uh, it will lead to a different checksum. But we ha we've tried really hard to in most simple cases, uh, we try to match it exactly as it is. So it works. If you look in test suite, uh, it, it works for a, big, a lot of cases. Uh, but even if it, it if it, if it mismatch, it's nothing but it's just slightly slightly different, a slower startup. It still get all the benefits of server side rendering. Meaning, uh, first time you see a page, you see actual content on it, and React uh, while React is initializing, you already see content. So it's it still have all the benefits. Okay, and uh, this is how rendering to, for React works. And uh, the way you set up your application, you actually you probably want to define this in CLG, CLGC file. So you have your component accessible from both server side and client side, right? And you can render them in both. Uh, the, uh, and what you render in both is the same component. Okay, and there is a second method uh, which is uh, called RAM render render static markup. And again, we do the same. We provide component in there. And what it does is render into just static HTML without all this React nonsense. Okay, actually, yeah, with, with React, there will be also stuff like kind of crazy stuff for example keys there will be keys and there will be um, uh, very strange comments around text blocks so you can see that I've done nothing uh, crazy there but I've got uh, all the crazy com comments react needs to keep track of text nodes and there are react IDs on every node uh, but if we use render static markup, it uh, just renders in uh, simple, pretty simple HTML. This can be useful for template generating. So you can actually use RAM to generate a template just you, you would use the way you would use Hiccup, for example. And it does exactly the same thing. It renders uh, this tree of uh, nested vectors into a string, actually. So there's also uh, the, the match syntax in most of the cases, and there's a test suite in a RAM project that will, that will check the performance of this on this static render against the hiccup render. Now, hiccup has two modes actually. Hiccup does a tricky things with pre compilation, it pre compiles the HTML if it sees it uh, inside its macro, and RAM does nothing of, of that on the server just yet. We'll probably get there. 
So if we compare uh, no pre-compilation for hiccup against no uh, the RAM default mode, uh, RAM will be like about three times faster than hiccup. But if hiccup is using pre-compilation, the results might be different, depending on how much pre-compilation you can get from the hiccup. Uh, yeah, this is server-side rendering, and this is actually the end of my notes, so I have told everything I wanted to, so if you have any questions or I haven't covered anything, let me know.